Well, hey guys, I hope your week is going well. I just polished off some coffee here in my It's All Good mug. Anyways, today's video is going to be one in which I talk about an ingredient that you all always are asking me about and that I love, and that is very useful for many different skin conditions and skin concerns, and that is ketoconazole. This is uh, a topical antifungal ingredient that has been in existence for many years and used in dermatology frequently. It is both available in a prescription, a shampoo, a cream, at a concentration of 2%, and you can also buy it over the counter at a concentration of 1% in the product known as Nizerol shampoo. But it's an antifungal medication. It has a very good broad spectrum for many different types of skin fungus and skin yeast. It covers the types of fungus that cause a ringworm on the body, so those red itchy round rashes that you might contract from your dog or cat. Um, and it also will treat a similar rash in the groin called jock itch. And it can be helpful for treating athlete's foot or ringworm on your feet. Um, so these are all fungus on the surface of the skin that cause annoying body rashes for which this is used. Um, it's not the best antifungal for those things, but it is effective and frequently used. Um, there are many antifungals out there. It also covers candida yeast very well. Candida is a yeast that can cause yeast infections in the vagina of women and can cause chelitis or known as perlesh. I have a video on angular chelitis, but can, can contribute to that. And it also can cause different types of rashes in the skin folds. It's not the same fungus as what causes ringworm. It's different, it's candida. But this drug, this active ingredient, will, will cover that and get, help get rid of that as well. And then, probably the skin skin yeast that more often than not people come here asking me questions about is our friend Malassezia or Pitorosporum. Pitorosporum is a little yeast that everybody has on their skin, but my goodness, it causes so many issues for people. It is, it's annoying. It contributes to seborrheic dermatitis on the face, uh, can contribute to rosacea to a certain extent, it is responsible for dandruff in the scalp, and responsible for something called pitorosporum folliculitis or fungal acne. And then on the body, it can cause this rash, which I have a video on, called pityriasis versicolor, also known as tinea versicolor. Because in dermatology, we can't just give something one name. We've got to give it 10 names to really confuse you. But anyways, tinea versicolor rash that consists of dark and white and light patches and is itchy, scaly, a nuisance. Uh, that is caused by by our little friend Malassezia. And ketoconazole has good coverage against Malassezia, or pitorosporum, whatever you want to call him. That little annoying yeast. Um, so good coverage against those, those, those um, fungi and yeast. But it also has very good anti-inflammatory properties. So not only does it treat the fungus and the yeast, but it calm down some of the inflammation that comes in the skin and leads to redness and irritation. So as part of it, the way it works, for example, for treating seborrheic dermatitis on the face, seborrheic dermatitis not only is caused by yeast, but there's also an immune response to that yeast that results in redness and, and irritation. And so the ketoconazole not only, you know, hits the yeast, but it also hits some of that inflammation. So it's helpful. Um, but in addition to um, its coverage against the, the fungi and the yeast and its ability to act as an anti-inflammatory when applied topically to the skin, uh, ketoconazole actually has um, the ability to inhibit um, something called dihydrotestosterone um, when applied to the skin. Uh, if you've watched my videos on male and female pattern hair loss, you know that those conditions are related to a genetic susceptibility for the hair shaft to be uber sensitive to dihydrotestosterone. And so these uh, ketoconazole actually can inhibit that, uh, that crosstalk between the hair follicle and dihydrotestosterone and has been shown to be helpful as an adjuvant, it's not gonna cure it, but as an adjuvant treatment to male and female pattern hair loss, as well as another type of hair loss called telogen effluvium or hair shedding. Individuals who use ketoconazole shampoo and are experiencing hair shedding, they can get improvement in their hair shedding and the thickness of the hair with use of a ketoconazole shampoo a few nights a week. 
And so it's helpful for many things. Um, not only is it helpful for treating skin infections due to fungi or, and or yeast, but also for hair loss and also as an anti-inflammatory. And as far as the different percentages, like the over-the-counter versus the prescription, I'm sure everybody wants to know, like, is one stronger or better than the other? I mean, if you come to a dermatologist, we're gonna prescribe you the 2% if things are bad, um, and then transition to the over-the-counter 1% stuff once stuff is under control to keep to keep it as maintenance, for example. So in the treatment setting, it's usually the 2%, um, but over-the-counter 1% ketoconazole shampoo can really do a lot for these different conditions as far as managing them. And if you've watched any of my videos on these different skin conditions, you know that they can be, they are and or can be chronic things that come and go and flare. And so having, using a 1% ketoconazole shampoo can be helpful as a maintenance. And whatever the condition is, you don't have to use this shampoo like daily, multiple times a day. In the case of seborrheic dermatitis on the face or dandruff in the scalp, you really only need to use the shampoo to those targeted areas a few, a few um, nights a week, two to three nights a week. And you may say, wait, you told me to use a shampoo on my face? Yes, you can use the shampoo on your skin. You just lather it up on the affected area, let it sit on the skin for a few minutes to allow that many, that active ingredient to penetrate and to, to kind of glom on there and do its thing. And then you just rinse it off, just like you would any other soap. So you definitely can use shampoos on your skin uh, for these kind of treatment purposes. And so yeah, that is, that is a great way to do it. If you have tinea versicolor on the body, likewise, lathering Nizoral shampoo all over, letting it sit on there. Um, in the shower for a few minutes and then rinsing it off, that will be helpful in maintaining that uh, and keeping it from coming back time and time again. So it's really helpful. Same holds true with, with treating the scalp for hair loss. When it comes to treating the scalp for hair loss, though, do know that this, the ketoconazole is probably not gonna cure it, but it, it can really enhance your treatment outcomes to other things. So for example, minoxidil is a treatment for male and female pattern hair loss. Minoxidil applied after lathering ketoconazole, uh, you know, you can probably get slightly better results than minoxidil alone. Also calms down the inflammation in the scalp and uh, any, any yeast that's on there on your scalp, any, any pterosperm that's on your scalp, will contribute to inflammation that can make the hair loss, whatever the type of hair loss is, can make the hair loss more problematic. So this kind of addresses that in a very maintainable way. Something that's over the counter, it's effective. It is also incredibly safe. It's safe in, you know, obviously adults, but it's also very safe in children and in, in infants, as well as during pregnancy. It, um, you know, applied to the skin, uh, it is not even detectable in the plasma after 72 hours. And in babies, in infants, in which ketoconazole 2% cream was applied to their entire scalp over a period of 10 days, throughout that entire 10-day treatment course, ketoconazole was not detectable in their plasma. And babies absorb things much, uh, much, much more readily and to a greater extent than fully mature adult skin. So it's very safe when applied topically and effective for many things. It's also very safe in pregnancy. In fact, um, you know, something that can happen during pregnancy, which is a pain to deal with, is a little uh, vulvovaginal or vaginal yeast infection. And uh, we have evidence showing that this is safe to treat that in pregnant women. And also we have literature showing that pregnant women who treated their, who had their vulvovaginal candidiasis treated with um, topical um, medications in this class, had a lower rate of premature birth rates than others. No, you should not be using ketoconazole to prevent premature birth. That's not what I'm saying. But uh, when you treat the cantaloupe infection with this, a salutary outcome is that you also have a lower, it also appears there's a lower rate of premature birth. So it's very safe, safe in adults, safe in children, safe in, um, pregnancy and in breastfeeding, it's safe. You just wouldn't want to put it on your breast and then breastfeed your baby and potentially expose them to ingesting it. But otherwise it is safe. It's not absorbed and detectable to any measurable level in the plasma and is going to be something that is more than safe to use and is frequently used a fair amount. 
So think of Nizerol or Ketoconazole as another tool in the fight against <laughs> seborrheic dermatitis, all things malassezia, all things pterosperum. I have videos talking about some of the other active ingredients and anti-dandruff shampoos that tackle this little sucker. And this is just one additional one that is available over the counter and is inexpensive. And you don't have to use it daily to get control of, of the seborrhea, of the dandruff, of the fungal acne. Um, you don't have to use it daily to prevent flares of Pterosporum versicolor, Tinea versicolor on the body. You just have to use it a few nights a week, so it's not, it's not a huge expense. Ketoconazole can be used with any other topical medication as well. Unlike, unlike some things that I've talked about on here which should not be combined with other things for this, that, the other reason, Ketoconazole applied topically, it, it plays well with other ingredients. So you don't have to worry, is this gonna, is this gonna, is this going to compromise the efficacy of my tretinoin? No, is this going to, uh, you know, compromise the efficacy of my topical metronidazole? No, um, ketoconazole doesn't, doesn't interfere with any of those other things. What are the side effects that people experience from applying it to the skin? Well, like anything, any topical, I mean, you can find any topical out there. Um, you can put air in a jar and 5% of people using it will experience stinging, burning, and irritation. The same holds true for topical ketoconazole. So about 5% of you out there will experience burning, stinging, and irritation to this. The majority of you will be more than fine with it and it won't cause issue for it. Um, it's hard to explain fully why the 5% of you experience this. It's thought that in some cases maybe it's due to propylene glycol. Propylene glycol is added to many prescription and over-the-counter topical medications. It functions as both a humectant, meaning it helps, it has moisturizing properties but it also functions as a penetration enhancer, meaning it helps the ketoconazole get into the skin better. And it's a double-edged sword in, in dermatology as a topical inactive ingredient, because while it helps make the active ingredients shine, it also can increase the irritation, and the sensation of stinging and, and burning associated with topicals. So um, that, that may be one explanation for some of the burning and stinging and irritation, but it's pretty low. It can be a little drying on the hair shaft, however, so I recommend, as I do with all kind of scalp dandruff type treatments, lather it to your scalp, ignore the hair shaft, um, and just lather it to the scalp, let it sit on the scalp, and then rinse it off. You can go ahead and use whatever shampoo you want after that and on the off days. So this is not your shampoo that you have to use exclusively for washing your hair. You also can use conditioner afterwards as well if you find that the Nizerol shampoos um, are a little too dry on the hair shaft and you get dry hair, brittle hair. Oh, and another benefit of Nizerol shampoo, which I forgot to point out, is that because it, top, it, it inhibits some of the uh, DHT topically, it also can reduce the amount, it has been shown to decrease the amount of sebum that is put out onto the skin where it is used. So if you are somebody with an oily scalp, many of you asked me about that, Nicerol shampoo lathered to the scalp a few nights a week in the shower and then left on there for a few minutes and rinsed off is a way to, to cut down on some of that, that oil production that, that comes out onto the skin. And, onto the skin of the scalp and make sure your scalp greasy. You could probably try it on your face as well for oily skin um, and likewise it could be it could be helpful in that that manner. So I hope this video was helpful to you guys. You know there are so many great things over the counter that are effective, useful, cheap, and undersold to you. Um, you know you're they're always trying to distract you with all these growth serums and placenta creams and and what whatnot but ketoconazole you know it it does work for many things it's not a, it's not a cure it's not a panacea but uh, it can be very beneficial for a variety of things namely those I discussed here so I hope this video was helpful to you guys comment below and if you use ketoconazole what your outcome has been with it, it you know it's variable but it can be very very helpful so if you like this video give it a thumbs up share it with your friends and as always don't forget sunscreen and subscribe I'll talk to you guys tomorrow bye